Welcome back to our microservices training series. In today's session, we'll explore the critical concept of resiliency. As microservices architectures grow in complexity, ensuring that your system can withstand failures and remain operational is more important than ever. In this video, we'll dive into essential resiliency techniques such as circuit breakers, retries, and health checks. We'll also discuss strategies for high availability and disaster recovery. And by the end of this tutorial, you'll have a clear understanding of how to design robust microservices that can gracefully handle faults and self-heal when necessary. So, if this sounds like a good plan to you, let's not waste any time and start. Let's dive into the key concepts of resiliency in microservices architecture. First, we have fault tolerance. This is the ability of a system to continue functioning properly even when components fail. In distributed systems, failures are inevitable, hardware can malfunction, database can fail, networks can go down, or software can encounter errors. The goal of fault tolerance is to maintain service functionality despite these failures. One common strategy is to isolate the failure from the rest of the system. By implementing fault tolerance, we ensure that a single point of failure doesn't bring down the entire system, preserving data integrity and user experience. Next, let's talk about high availability, or HA. This concept focuses on ensuring continuous service accessibility. The aim is to keep your system up and running 24-7, which is crucial for applications that can't afford downtime, like e-commerce platforms or critical business services. One key strategy for achieving high availability is the use of availability zones, or AZs. These are isolated locations within a cloud region that have their own power, cooling, and networking. We'll double-click on how to use AZ and region in a few minutes. But long story short, by distributing your services across multiple AZs and multiple regions, you can maintain operations even if one zone or one region experiences issues. Lastly, we have disaster recovery, or DR. This involves strategies for recovering from major system failures. While high availability focuses on preventing downtime, disaster recovery is about bouncing back when significant issues do occur. This could involve geographic redundancy, where your system can operate from a different location if an entire data center fails. Again, we'll talk about these strategies in more details in a few minutes. Now, to close on these key concepts, it's important to understand the difference between HA and DR. High availability is about keeping services running smoothly day to day, often handling smaller, localized issues. Disaster recovery, on the other hand, deals with larger, catastrophic events that could potentially take down your entire system. Both are crucial components of a resilient microservices architecture. Okay, now that we've covered the key concepts of resiliency, let's dive into specific techniques that can be implemented in your microservices architecture to enhance fault tolerance and system reliability. We'll explore five critical resiliency patterns and strategies. First, we'll look at the circuit breaker pattern, which helps prevent cascading failures. Then, we'll discuss retry and timeout mechanisms for handling transient failures. Next, we'll explore the bulkhead pattern for isolating components. We'll also cover health checks and self-healing strategies, which are crucial for maintaining system integrity. Finally, we'll touch on how service mesh can be leveraged for resiliency. I won't dive into the circuit breaker pattern since I already discussed this pattern in a previous tutorial. But let us apply this pattern to our e-commerce solution and more specifically to the inventory service to better protect the product service. Picture this. We've just received a large number of latest iPhone in our warehouse and want to update the inventory to reflect the correct number in our stock. The first thing the inventory service is going to do is call the product service to get the product ID for the latest iPhone. Inventory service calls the product service and obtains the product ID. So far, all is good. The circuit breaker from the inventory service to the product service is closed. Some orders are placed by our customer to purchase this new phone, and the inventory service calls once again the product service to ensure the ordered product is the right one, and the call fails. The call is retried and fails again. This breaches our defined threshold and the circuit break trips. After a short timeout, using for example, an exponential backoff logic, the call is retried again but fails again. Finally, after an even longer timeout, using some type of jitter randomization logic, the circuit breaker is reset going to the half-open state, allowing the inventory service to try again the call. This time, we're lucky, 
The product service responds successfully, and we can close the circuit breaker. However, if the call fails again, then we're going back to the open state to give more time to the product service to recover from its failure. Now, as a solution architect or a microservice owner, there are several critical questions to answer when implementing this pattern. When should the circuit trip last go from closed to open? How many failed requests within a certain period should we consider for the decision? How do we quantify a failure? What's the expected time or SLA the product service should respond to our request before we consider it a failure? When does the circuit can be closed again? How long after a circuit trip we should try again? How long should we give to the product service to recover? Long story short, there are a lot of non-trivial questions that must be answered before implementing such pattern. And on that note, let's move on. Let's now explore retry and timeout mechanisms, essential tools in our resiliency toolkit. In distributed systems, transient failures are common. A service might be temporarily unavailable due to network issues or high load. This is where retry mechanisms come in. When a request fails, instead of immediately returning an error, the system attempts the request again. However, we need to be smart about retries. Retrying every X seconds isn't a good strategy as retrying too often will introduce an increase of load to the server which can potentially contribute to further degradation. But, implementing a jitter or an exponential backoff strategy is. This means randomizing or increasing the wait time between retry attempts. For example, wait one second, then two, then four, and so on. This approach prevents overwhelming the target service and allows time for it to recover. On the positive note, Many SDKs provide support for exponential backoff and jitter as part of their retry handling. So, no need to reinvent the wheel here. Equally important are timeout mechanisms. Every request should have a defined timeout period. If a response isn't received within this time, the request is considered failed. This prevents your system from hanging indefinitely on unresponsive services. When implementing timeouts in microservices, it's crucial to set appropriate durations typically ranging from milliseconds to a few seconds. Timeouts that are too short may lead to unnecessary failures and retries, while excessively long timeouts can tie up resources and degrade overall system performance. The key is to balance these mechanisms. Too aggressive retries can exacerbate problems, while overly cautious timeouts might prematurely abort valid operations. It's about finding the right equilibrium for your specific use case. Remember, well-implemented retry and timeout strategies can significantly improve your system's resilience to transient failures, ensuring smoother operation in the face of temporary disruptions. Let's explore the bulkhead pattern and the problem it aims to solve. Let's continue with our e-commerce microservices architecture. At the front, we have an API gateway that routes incoming requests to various services. This API gateway has a thread pool to handle user requests. It's important to note that this thread pool physically limits the number of concurrent users our system can manage. Now, let's consider a scenario where our product service is experiencing issues and running very slowly. A user sends a payment request, which gets processed normally. Another user's shopping cart request is also handled without issues. An order tracking request comes in and is processed as expected. However, when another payment request comes in, it gets stuck waiting for a response from the slow product service. The same happens with yet another payment request. As more requests come in, they start to pile up. Eventually, our API gateway has to start rejecting requests because all threads are occupied. This continues, and more legitimate requests are rejected, even those for services that are functioning correctly. This scenario illustrates a critical vulnerability in our system. A problem in one service is causing a system-wide failure, affecting all our services. This is precisely the issue that the bulkhead pattern is designed to address. Now, let's see how the bulkhead pattern solves this problem. The key idea of the bulkhead pattern is to allocate a maximum number of threads to each service based on their forecasted load. This creates isolated pools of resources for each service. When a payment request comes in, it's allocated to the payment service's thread pool. A shopping cart request is handled by its dedicated pool. Similarly, an order tracking request goes to its own set of threads. Another payment request comes in and is processed normally. More payment requests arrive and are handled until we reach the maximum number of threads allocated for the payment service. 
This is where the magic of the bulkhead pattern becomes apparent. An order tracking request comes in, and despite the payment service being at capacity, it's processed normally because it has its own resource pool. Now, when another payment request arrives, it gets rejected because the payment service's thread pool is full. However, the system can provide a custom prepared error response specific to the service experiencing an issue, improving the user experience. Meanwhile, an inventory service request comes in and is processed without any problems, unaffected by the issues in the payment service. This is the essence of the bulkhead pattern. By compartmentalizing resources, we prevent issues in one service from consuming all available resources and affecting the entire system. It's like the watertight compartments in a ship. Damage to one compartment doesn't sink the whole vessel. This approach significantly enhances the resilience and stability of our microservices architecture. Now, let's explore health checks and self-healing mechanisms, which are crucial components for maintaining the integrity and availability of our microservices architecture. Health checks are essentially special REST API endpoints that allow microservices to self-check their status and dependencies. These checks can assess various aspects, including database connections, system properties, resource availability, and even the status of other dependent services. Implementing health checks is straightforward. For instance, in a Java environment, you might use the MicroProfile Health API. This allows you to create custom health check procedures by simply implementing the health check interface and adding annotations like liveness or readiness to your classes. Now, let's talk about how these health checks tie into self-healing. When a service fails a health check, automated self-healing mechanisms can be triggered. These might include restarting the failing service, rerouting traffic away from unhealthy instances, spinning up new instances to replace failing ones. For example, if we integrate these health checks with Kubernetes, we can use liveness probes to automatically restart pods that fail health checks, and readiness probes to ensure traffic is only routed to healthy instances. The benefits of this approach are significant. We can reduce downtime, we can maintain high availability, and we can minimize the need for manual intervention. Remember, in a microservices architecture, failures are inevitable. The key is to detect these failures quickly and respond automatically allowing our system to self-heal and maintain overall functionality even when individual components fail. By implementing robust health checks and self-healing mechanisms, we create a more resilient, fault-tolerant system that can withstand the challenges of a distributed architecture. Okay, let's now explore how service mesh enhances resiliency. As we develop microservices, deploying them is often a challenging task with the configuration of the network, load balancers, firewalls, DNS to ensure our microservices can be discovered and interact with the world securely. So here comes the concept of service mesh. First, let me say that if you want to fully understand what service mesh is, I'd be happy to develop a more in-depth training video on this foundational concept. But right now, in the interest of time, let me simply explain that service mesh is a software layer that handles all communication between services and applications. More specifically, to manage connections between services, a service mesh provides features like monitoring, logging, tracing, and traffic control. It's independent of each service's code, which allows it to work across network boundaries and with multiple service management systems. So long story short, a service mesh provides infrastructure-level resiliency, acting as a dedicated layer that manages service-to-service -service communication. This approach offloads critical resiliency features from individual services to the mesh itself. One key benefit is advanced traffic management. Service mesh offers fine-grained control over request routing and traffic behavior. It can implement intelligent load balancing, using algorithms like round-robin or least connections to distribute requests optimally across service instances. This ensures high availability and prevents bottlenecks. Moreover, Service Mesh excels in observability. It provides comprehensive monitoring features, allowing you to gain deep insights into your service's health, performance, and behavior. This visibility is crucial for quick problem detection and resolution. The Mesh can also implement resiliency patterns we've discussed earlier, such as circuit breaking, retries, and timeouts, but at the infrastructure level. This means these critical features are consistently applied across all services without burdening developers with their implementation. Lastly, Service Mesh supports advanced deployment strategies like canary releases and A-B testing. 
These techniques allow for controlled rollouts of new features, minimizing risks and enabling data-driven decision-making. By leveraging a service mesh, you're not just adding a layer of resilience. You're empowering your entire microservices ecosystem to be more robust, observable, and adaptable to change. Now, let's explore how to implement resiliency across different environments. First, let's consider utilizing availability zones for high availability. An AZ is one or more discrete data centers with redundant power, networking, and connectivity in a specific geographical region. Each AZ is isolated but connected to other AZs within the same region via low latency links. AZs are designed to be independent, so failures in one AZ don't affect others. This means that by distributing your services across multiple AZs within a region, you create a robust system that can withstand localized failures. This approach ensures that if one zone experiences issues, your services can continue running in other zones, maintaining operational continuity. Now, for disaster recovery, we need to think beyond a single region. Implementing cross-region strategies involves replicating your services and data across geographically distant regions. This approach safeguards against large-scale disasters that could affect an entire region. It's crucial to have automated failover mechanisms in place to redirect traffic to the backup region if needed. However, it's important to balance these resilience measures with cost considerations. While maximum resilience might involve deploying in multiple regions with real-time data replication, this can be expensive. You need to assess your specific requirements, Consider factors like your recovery time objectives, data consistency needs, and regulatory compliance. Then, design a solution that provides the right level of resilience without unnecessary overhead. Remember, the goal is to create a resilient system that meets your business needs while optimizing resource utilization and costs. When it comes to building resilient microservices, two best practices stand out. First, design for failure from the start. This means anticipating potential points of failure and creating systems that can withstand and recover from them. Here, some key principles is to assume that failures will happen, to implement graceful degradation to maintain partial functionality, and to isolate services to prevent cascading failures. Techniques such as the circuit breaker pattern can be employed to stop requests to a failing service, while the bulkhead pattern isolates different components to ensure that if one fails, others continue to operate. Additionally, Using timeout and retry mechanisms with exponential backoff helps manage transient issues effectively. Tools like Hystrix or Resilience 4J can assist in implementing these patterns. By proactively designing your architecture with these strategies in mind, you can significantly enhance the resilience of your microservices. Second, embrace continuous testing and chaos engineering. Regular testing helps identify vulnerabilities, while chaos engineering simulates failures to ensure your system can withstand unexpected issues. Remember, we covered chaos engineering in depth in our earlier video on testing. I encourage you to check it out for a deeper dive. By incorporating these practices, you'll be well on your way to creating truly resilient microservices. To wrap up, today, we've explored key resiliency concepts like fault tolerance, high availability, and disaster recovery. We've also covered essential techniques such as circuit breakers, bulkhead patterns, retries and timeouts mechanisms as well as health checks. These aren't just theoretical concepts, they're put into practice by teams like the Amazon's High Velocity Events team, who use these strategies to ensure that today's deals and prime day pages remain stable under immense traffic. And on that short note, first, let me thank you for watching. And, as always, for more insights on building robust, scalable systems, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time.